Christian church in God good. Let's that, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We pray your name. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you, God, that you're always with us. And God, everything is always in your hands, God. We trust you totally. And we know, God, that these last days, you said they were coming. And here they are. We're not only in the last days, we're in the last moments. Ask you right now, Lord, bless and to anoint this service in the name of Jesus we pray. Church said, Amen. Now, before you get started, I want you to please share and pray for Israel. Now, 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 it's very important. You've got to understand something here. This is not a time to politicize things. Okay? So don't politicize it. But if I, you know, if I start pulling sides, this is God's people under attack. All right? And I'm going to give you some real facts. I'm not, I'm not basing this on how I feel or how somebody else is feel. I'm not giving you my opinion because I've got an opinion. But I, right now, am trying to tell you the facts. Israel right now is saying this, a uh, personal leader is saying this is their 9-11. Others said this is the Pearl Harbor. But the, hot, the, the Hamas terrorists have invaded the land by land, by sea, by land, by air. They have invaded Israel. Okay? And, then, and not only them alone, but Hamas sympathizers on the border are also helping uh, what's going on now. And now Hezbollah, which means in their language, their language is the army of God. Hezbollah, who's a lot bigger organization, uh, they're condoning this and they're offering their support by arms and missiles. There's been over 6,000 missiles uh, so far shot into Israel. Wives, all the way, all the survivors have been drug off in the street and drug off uh, and killed as hostage. Little kids have been drug into the street and shot. Okay, and wives and husbands. Okay, if they did it on Shabbat, which is Sabbath. And so there's several things going on here. Let me just explain this. If people hear it, they don't understand exactly what they're saying. First, Israel is the size of New Jersey. Just think about that now. Israel is the size of New Jersey. That's how big that state is. But it is the center of the world. Okay, because all religions go there. You've got, you've got the Muslims, you've got the Christians, and you got to choose. It's the center of the world. This is where Jesus is coming back to on the Mount of Olives. So, so they did on, on Shabbat, which is a Sabbath. And so during Shabbat, the regular citizens had turned off their electronics. They turned off their TVs. They turned off everything. So they didn't hear what was going on when the, when the terrorists marched in their home and started pulling them out of their homes. And they're still doing it now as we speak. Up to now, when all the authorities that have been watching it all night, this morning as we speak, over 600 Israelis have been killed. And over 2,000 have been injured. This is not a joke. This is not time to politicize. This is the time to say we need to get to praying for Israel because this is serious, serious business because Israel's God's people. Okay? So, they did it on Shabbat. Also, this is the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is September 29th, 1956. Uh, 50 years ago, 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur is the holiest day in Israel. It's September 24th and 25th. That's when the high priest goes to the Holy of Holies and offers up a sacrifice for Israel. So all this stuff is all around on the list. From the economy where everybody else was, was worshiping God between the Feast of Tabernacles and Shabbat. They, they just had their guard down and then they come in and they're taking, they're trying to take over. This is the first time in 50 years that the Prime Minister comes up immediately and says, we are in a state of war and we declare war. We declare war. 
Okay, so this is serious business. This is not just a, a, a just something you know just going while it's going to go away. And in an Iran, uh, they're shouting death to Israel, and they're also shouting death to the U.S. Okay, so I'm not getting into the policies and political stuff. I'm staying away from that right now. What I'm saying is, so we could have this happen with our soul. Israel is heavily guarded as they are, and with the intelligence force they've got. If this can happen to them, they come across the border unnoticed, they kill soldiers that were sleeping, they took <laughs> tanks and guns and carried them back over into the Gaza Strip. All right? So this is heavy duty stuff and, and it's unprecedented. Nothing like this has happened in over 50 years since the 1973 Yom War. And so it's time for us to stand and pray not only for Israel, but for us too, because if they're shouting death to Israel and death to the U.S., something like this could happen here too. I know we said it can't. Well, they went up below the Iron Shield that they had. So, so we, I watched it last night. I was watching it as they were shooting missiles over. They were hitting the Iron Shield. Some of them were messing the Iron Shield. They were trying to overwhelm that shield when they were coming in under the shield. And so, 6,000 rockets have been fired. Think about all these deaths, and I'm not even going to mention what I saw. And some of the guys said we can't even show you some of some of the videos that have been posted because uh, people can't handle them. And what I saw last night was terrible. It was ferocious. The stuff I saw. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray for Israel. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do it together. And now we're going to do Psalm 83. I want y'all to see it up here. We're going to pray this together. Remember, this is not about politics. This is not about Democrat, Republican, Independent. This is not about the British. And who, no, this is about Israel. Okay? Now, we're going to pray because these are God's people. He said, and he said they're the apple of his eye. So it's going, to, it's going to wind up being a bad thing because he said once they become a state, they're never going to be taken away again. So something, something's going to happen. The Bible says in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's going to be two uh, battles of Armageddon. The first one is before the rapture, because when before the rapture, the, the weapons are going to burn for seven years. They're going to provide a fuel for Israel for seven years. So if it's at the end of the seven years, that's impossible. And it said it's going to take them seven months to bury the dead from this war, and that the blood will be up to the horse's bridle. So this is not me talking, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to just tell you the facts. So this could be happening, this could be the very break of this happening because of, because a uh, uh, conglomeration of countries are going to come against Israel, but it doesn't mean they're all going to be there. It also can mean that they can be supplying the, supplying the troops or supplying Hezbollah and supplying Hamas. And so, and so they already can take all these other countries are already uh, supplying and weapons because who in the world how can a little bit of terrorist organization like Hamas do what they're doing right now? Somebody's definitely giving them, somebody's supporting them. So, we're going to support Israel. So get ready. We're going to pray this prayer. This is not, again, this is not my words. This is God's word. It's Psalm 83, and I got it in the Blue Living Translation because sometimes the King James Version we get reading and we just kind of look at things and kind of start mumbling over because sometimes it doesn't it's in the lips of meek than English. This is in our language. All right, ready? Let's all stand. And I want us to see this and read it together. And remember, this is not about politics. This is about God's people. And again, they were still counting the death tolls, and people were still being shot as we talk because they can't seem to stop these little cells that are going through. And this could be happening to us, so you've got to make sure we pray for Israel. Well, here it goes. I'm going to hear what I can see. These glasses are so good. Nah. Uh, my fact, they've already fixed my glasses three times, and I still haven't seen them yet. So I'm waiting for them. They told me i got to wait another week, and they're going to try to you know, fix them. Here it goes. Say it with me. Oh God, do not be silent. Do not be dead. Do not be quiet, oh God. Don't you hear the uproar of your enemies? Don't you see your arrogant enemies are rising up? They devise crafty schemes against your people. They conspire against your precious ones. Come, they say, let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of its existence. 
Yes, this is their unanimous decision. They signed a treaty as allies against you, those Edomites and Israelites, uh, Moabites and Hagarites, and give the lights and Amorites, or Amorites and Amorites, and Amorites, Amorites, and people from Philistia, Philistia, and Tyre. Assyria joined them too. In other words, there's a multiple, a multiple nation coming against them. And it's allied with the descendants of Lot. Here it is. Here's the last part of it. Do to them as you did to the Midianites, as you did to Syria and Jabin and the Kishon River. They were destroyed at Endor. They're decaying corpses, fertilized the soil, letting their uh, mighty nobles die as Orm and Zeb did. Let all the princes die like Zebob and Zalmanah. But they said, let us see siege for our own. Use these pastlands of God. Oh my God, scatter them like tumbleweed, like shaft before the wind. As the fire burns the forest, and as the flame sets a mountain ablaze, chase them with your fire, fierce storm, terrify them with your tempest, utterly disgrace them until they submit to your name, O oh Lord. Let them be ashamed and terrified forever, let them die in disgrace. Then they will, will learn that you alone are called the Lord, and that you alone are the most high supreme over all the earth. Give the Lord uh, a hand clap of praise and a shout. Come on. Thank you, Father. According to your word, Lord, take the battle. The Bible says, once these people come up against him, they're not going to win. That God is going to miraculously help Israel take on this federation that's come against them, and when they do, it's going to be a sight to be seen. Remember, what's this? The, the blood to up to the horses' bridle, seven months burying the dead, and their weapons being used as fuel for seven years. Wow! Something very weird and something very powerful and something astonishing is getting ready to happen, and we need to be ready, armed with information and armed with His Word and armed with what God's doing, because this is no time for us to argue with pity man. Now stay on point, stay on guard, because if you don't, it can happen in our own backyard. Amen. Okay? Because they're saying all the, the not a chance just death to Israel. They always ended up in death to the U.S. Okay? So, so, here it goes. We're going to trust God with all this. Amen? Yeah. Everybody say amen. Amen. Yeah. God is good. All the time. All the time. I did see a little, I did see a little, little cartoon that said, how does the devil know how to find a Christian that's hiding? And he's looking around, he can't find it, so all of a sudden the devil hung out, God is good! And the Christian said, all the time, he said, there he is. <laughs> all right. Get ready. Spiritual warfare. 10% Satan's tactics. 90% how we respond. Remember, with God, we are not helpless, hopeless, but we are powerful. Say that again. We are not helpless, hopeless, but we are powerful. Give Lord a hand type of praise. Come on. These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish them. I'm here to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one, except my worship of the Lord. God is good all the time. Amen, amen, amen. We're gonna, we're gonna, I know we sing these quite often, but we were going to sing other ones, but we changed back to these, and, and this is going to be good, because at the end we're going to sing something a cappella, and I believe with all my heart, something very special is going to happen. Amen? Amen? No, it's so, so awesome. Don't you read this thing? <clears throat> I see praise.
you don't like to go and like this, not knowing I don't know how long I'll be there. Won't be there long if they can't do anything. But um, if I'm there past next Sunday, pray again that what you're doing is working. Amen. And I'll keep in touch with my brother, and that's him by what's going on. Amen. And also, Brother Nancy Hubbard, she was just in the hospital. She's got cancer, and she had pneumonia. And now she's back out of the hospital. We pray for her, too. Just pray for, pray for Israel and pray. The Bible says in your bulletins, obviously, God said, pray for Israel. It's peace in Jerusalem. So send this to be in your bulletin. That, so you can keep that in mind. So plus, I'm going to read this prayer. I'm going to get some of my copies made and put out there so you can grab one. And if you know what else to pray, can't think it doesn't pray. Because this is, I really believe that the Ezekiel 38 and 39 is happening right in front of us. And, and it's a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. Now let's do this prayer. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We know, God, that you're alive and well on from a Father. We know, God, that everything is in your hands. It's in your time. And Father, you see it all and you know it all. I ask you right now, Lord, you shed it, that these things were coming. And Father, we know that. And so we thank you that you've already seen this. You've already seen the end. All we're seeing is the beginning, and it's horrific, terrible, and it seems like no end in sight. But you show us the other side, the other side where you win. And I thank you for that. And God, until you win, help us, God, to trust you in the middle of this battle. And Lord, these people have got cancer. Lord, I said, touch Francis, Lord. I ask you, God, to touch Nancy. Lord, minister to them. And anybody else that needs prayer right now, just touch them, touch their bodies. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And church said, yeah. amen, amen, amen. Now, get ready. We're going to we're gonna have a little fun. And then we're going to sing an acapella song. Everybody stand up. Don't stand up. <laughs> Yesterday, after uh, I started watching the news and saw the stuff that was going on, there was a song that just kept 
Kevin, fly around in my heart, and I love it. I just want us to do it together today, okay? Let's do this one together. No, no music, we just don't sing it, okay? God's got this. Don't, I say this, God's got this. Don't think he doesn't. God's got this. Ready? Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Come on. Master, Savior, come on. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms may all pass away, but there's something about that. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, and so one day he's walking in the house and he'd been walking around for, for about a week or so and he could walk around just drooping around the house and he's drooping in his prayers and drooping with the word. He's just droop, 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 droop. And his wife come to him and she said, and she was dressed in black. He said, why are you dressed in black? He said, because God's dead. He said, excuse me. He said, God's dead. He died. She says, don't you know that God's not dead? God cannot be killed. God is almighty. God is all powerful. God is the beginning and the end. He's got all power, all the morning. He's all in one. How long can you say God's dead? She said, what did that like? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And God's in control. Let's act like it. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I was, I was looking. <laughs> Uh, there's been a lot of, been a lot of, uh, uh, I just say there's been a lot of these, the, 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 some of the things I've been, we've been praying for people about, reminding me of this joke. I thought you were going through, but it reminded me of this story. Here it is. A dinner speaker was in such a hurry, and my daddy is the number one. A dinner speaker was in such a hurry to get his engagement, get to his engagement, that when he arrived and sat down at the head of the table, he suddenly realized that he forgot his false teeth. That's a bad feeling. Turned to the man next to me, complained. He said, I got my teeth. What am I going to do now? The man said, No problem. The man reached into his pocket and pulled out a pair of false teeth. Try these, he said. The speaker tried them on and said, Too loose. The man said, Ain't no problem. I got another pair. She reached into another pocket and pulled out another pair and said, Try these. The speaker tried them on and responded, These are too tight. The man won't take him back at all. He said, I got another pair of other pockets. So he reached the other pocket and says, try these, and the speaker put them in. They fit perfectly. But then he ate his meal and gave his speech at the, at the dinner meeting. When it was over, the speaker went to thank the man who had helped him. He said, I want to thank you for coming to my aid. Where is your office? I've been looking for a good dentist. The man replied, I'm not a dentist, I'm an undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't got no bit now. That was, that was... <laughs> my father-in-law, my father-in-law said he needed some balls. He, he went to the, he went to the dentist and he about got some for. He told me he said he went to the dentist and it was like a thousand, two thousand dollars. This was way back. So he went for it up without teeth and then one day he had them teeth just to shine in. I said, I thought she did with two highs and I found something for twenty-five dollars. He said, I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, but I had, I said, really, for $25? He said, yeah, but I had to go to the funeral home to get them. He said, I tried on 10 pair before I found the ones that fit. 
He said, I carried them back out for a week. We got another pair. I said, I thought she said they fit. He said, yeah, but it belongs to a woman. And if I talk to you today. <laughs> okay, the members did not think that was cute. All right. <laughs> All right. I couldn't say a woman and a man's teeth. All right. We're going to finish this up today. And, and, and this is really, 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 really awesome that we don't know when you're working on sermons so that things happen like Israel. You know, Israel being attacked should shake you to the core. You know, it's kind of like 9-11. 9 11 didn't shake you to the core, something's wrong. Because you know something very terrible had happened and a lot of people had died. You know, this is the same way now, you know, and, and so it's really, really bad. And, and so we need to pray for God to, to handle this because in all of it, even Israel's response, there's going to be some collateral damage. You know what collateral damage is? That's when innocent people get hurt, when they get killed. So we don't, so there's already been 200, about 250 lives on the Gaza Strip have already been taken in a counterattack, and Israel's trying not to try these precision strikes, but at the same time, because there's so many millions of people in that little bit of area that that they're going to wind up getting uh, people that's not guilty. So, so this whole thing is just, no matter how you look at it, there's no winners. None. There's no winners. And so, so let, let's just pray for God and do something special. But now's the time. Now's the time for this, okay? Now this is, of course, uh, it is, excuse me? <laughs> I didn't know how to put it over there, excuse me? And we're talking about excuses. So, so I'm not going to go totally over everything from last week, but I'm going to pick up from last week to bring you into this week. Now, has anybody noticed that the world was going crazy? Yeah. And, and, and the wild thing was, is that I had no idea what was going to happen yesterday. Nothing, nothing. I had no idea what was going on. I was busy working on my sermon, and and, and Jason and y'all, y'all were the ones. Y'all were the ones. Y'all hadn't told me. I went hundred times. Don't look at the news. I was looking at hundred improvement. Yeah, I was looking at hundred improvement. When y'all told me, you know, uh, I, I started looking in there, and there it was. And it just blew me away. And, and it's been stuck there ever since. And a couple of times, wife said we got to change. Change channels for just a minute and go we'll watch the Western so you can breathe again. Amen. So, so it's been something. Anybody ever notice that the world has gone crazier since last week? Okay. Now, now, now is not the time to lay up. Now is not the time to stay in shadows. Now is the time for the church to rise and shine. Okay. Whenever darkness gets the earth, the church always shines. If you look in the book of Acts, the Church of Acts did not grow when things were going good. The Church of Acts always grew when there was problems and when there were satanic attacks. That's when they grew. And all of a sudden, talk about the sorcerers and, the, and Satan and the saying that they ended up saying the church grew mightily. Because, because, because honestly, it's during that time, we have to remember everything's going great. We don't get our eyes on God. We get our eyes off God and on the blessing. <coughs> but, when, but when things get going tough, we get our eyes off the blessing and get our eyes back on the blessing. And so that's what we're doing now. We're sitting on a hill that cannot be hid. We're the salt of this, this world. We're the light of this world. So, so we've got to make sure that we stay on top of things. But instead, I notice this over and over and over. And I catch my own self and have to stop myself in the middle sometimes. We become a generation of excuses. I, I've heard so many excuses. My glasses, you know, I, when I got my glasses, I weren't told how these things were going to be. And once I got them, and I'm stumbling over things and falling out of stairs and all kinds of stuff and telling them I can't see and, and knocking over stuff. And they went, well, didn't they tell you that you can only, when you put these glasses on, you can only see this, this is your field of vision. It's right here. I said, y'all didn't exactly tell me that. And, and your eyes, they didn't keep prescriptions right. So now, not only are you going to see here, but it's kind of like seeing here and pulling down a little bit because I can't see everything. And so, so I keep asking them to fix them. And this is the third try. I'm still wearing these. And, 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 uh, and I'll keep hearing excuses, excuses, excuses. Well, I'm trying to hear excuses. I can't see. And my vision's getting worse. 
And so that's, that's the time that we're living in. You go to the service desk, or go ask, like, do you see where something's at? And they'll go, here's how they do it. Just there, a pat answer. Or did you see it on the floor? Oh, no, ma'am, that's what I'm asking you. But if you didn't see it on the floor, we ain't got it. And I walk around and find them. And I go around and say, well, I have to find one that you say is not here. You know, because we live in a generation of excuses and just get by. All right? So now, this generation that we live in, we've traded our excellence. We've traded excellence for excuses. Instead of searching for ways for a way to be excellent, we actually are searching for an excuse to explain mediocrity. I, I get tired of hearing it. Well, it's COVID. Well, it's the economy. Well, I don't have any time. I don't have any money. And this attitude of money for this, this attitude is crept into the church. And let me just tell you something again. I want you to understand there's a difference in a reason and an excuse. A reason is a real thing. If you're sick, you're, that's, that's a reason. You know, if you got a flat tire, that's a reason. If your car won't crank, that's a reason. If you lost your job, that's a reason. If you got to work, that's a reason. But if you got to fill up and start getting down, tell them to try and think of something. Y'all had somebody one time, they made an excuse. They kept saying, bring me to church. You're going to pick me up. I'll go to church with you. Come bring me up. I'll go to church with you. I get there on Sunday morning and they say, this is no, no joke. They go, well, I can't come this morning because such and such. I said, come back next week. So I come back next week. And they say, well, I, I was, but, you know, uh, and after about the third week, I told my wife, I'm going to fix this. And she said, what are you going to do? This was somebody in my family. I took a jar, the mason jar, and I put in things like, I need to wash my hair, I need to wash the car, blow dry broke, the dog won't bark, you know, the dog got fleas, whatever, and I put them, put them in that jar. And I walked up and they said, I was going to go to church, but I said, no, no, but, here you go. And I opened up the jar and said, here, pick one. And it's just huge thing. I said, I'm going to save you the time of trying to figure out new excuse every week. Just pull out of this jar. <laughs> and she said, well, my dog's got to please. Yes, but how's that going to stop me? I said, the same way everything else every week stops you. The same way. <laughs> you know what? They said, throw the jar away, please. Look at it. So there's a difference in the reason and an excuse. There's no time to make excuses. We need to be optimistic. We need to believe in ourselves. How many of you ever heard of beast mode? People are working out. The beast mode is you're working out. People that are doing things. You know, you're over your job and you're trying to get things done. Let's go to beast mode. Let's get this done. It's amazing what can happen when we go uh, in the beast mode. So here it is. This is here's where we're going to stop from last week. I'm not talking about the other stuff we talked about last week. But yeah, I couldn't leave these out. He is good for making excuses and selling goods for anything else. Excuses are all the crutches for the uncommitted. Excuses are really, merely nails used to build a house of failure. Now, I use these all the time at fountain. Somebody come up and go, yeah, 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 yeah. I go, and I tell them this, and they quit giving up. Excuses will always be there, but the opportunity won't. Very, very, very powerful. So now, now, I'm going, now, here was where we stopped last week. I gave you a couple of excuses, and I'm not going to dwell on them. I'm just going to give so you have all five. Moses, God's calling Moses. And when God's calling Moses, Moses has been in the desert 40 years. He's 80 years old. If anybody had a call in their life, it was Moses. If anybody had falls and failure in their life, it was Moses. How many had failure in your life? How many saw, was it this morning? Uh, I think it was this morning, this morning or yesterday morning. Uh, Mighty Army. Here it is. Here it is this morning. The more you fail, the more you win. It's the law no one can break. It's powerful. So don't think because you've fallen or you failed that God can't use you. There was a man years ago that worked at uh, IBM. And he made a $70,000 mistake. And this is like 20 years ago, when $70,000 was wild compared to now. He made a $70,000 mistake. And some of the corporate guys said, why don't you fire this guy? Fire him, he said. He said, I'm going to give him a raise. He said, why? He said, I just spent $70,000 teaching him what not to do. 
That's true. That's a true. True story. <laughs> All right. So, so, so Moses, Moses had a big, had a big mission, but his big mission was overshadowed by his omissions, by his big excuses. I'm gonna read this. Get your Bible out if you want to. Exodus chapter three. <laughs> Mark it in your Bible so you get to go back to it, not forget it. Moses chapter 3, verse 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go with Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he says, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token of thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So God's not going to say, I'm calling you, but as good as done. It's already done. You haven't seen it yet, but I'm telling you, when you come back, it's going to be awesome here. In other words, you're going to do this thing. I know you don't see it. I know you don't understand how you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. Most of the time, God, behold, when I come to children of Israel, they shall not, they, and say to them, or shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, why is his name? Why shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he, and he said, thus, Shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto thee. And God said, Moreover, unto Moses thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name for you forever, and this is my memorial for all generations. Start right there. He didn't say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Abraham. <laughs> He did. Israel was after God, got working on Jacob, wrestled with him, and Jacob became a prince of God, Israel. But until that time, he was conniving. He's always figuring out things on his own. Even the thing he's still capture, he was always trying to get things underhanded. So God said, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the God of that underhanded rat, Jacob. Wow. If he can use Jacob, I promise you he can use us. Amen? So go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto thee, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done unto you in the east. And he said, and I have said, I will bring you out of the nation of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken thy, thy voice, and they shall come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and you shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews have sent me, which sent, have met with us, and now let us go. We will see the three days journey in the wilderness, and we may sacrifice to the Lord our, Lord our God. And I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all wonders which I will do the mystery of, and out there he will let you go. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, what caused these five big excuses? What caused it? Number one, he was focused on what is, not what is. Let me change that, not just the what is. I tell people this in, when I'm counseling. I tell people this at the detention center all the time. I want you to think about this. Whenever you have a challenge before you, or if you spend your nights awake, saying, I shoulda, coulda, woulda. I shoulda, coulda, woulda. I shoulda, coulda, woulda. You're fighting in the past, depressing thoughts. But if you're lying there looking at night and going, what if? What if they don't listen? What if they don't care? What if I can't make it? What if I lose my job? What if, what if, what if? That's anxiety. Most people walk around this earth with anxiety and depressive thoughts beating them all the time. What if, what if, what if? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. What if, what if, what if? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. We need to be saying, God is here. God is in control by the fact. Here's what you say. When you hear, when you hear this, shoulda, coulda, woulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Or you hear, what if, what if, what if. Here's what I want you to practice saying. I am here 
and so is God, I am saved. Say that. Say it with me. I am here, and so is God, I, I am saved. Try one more time. I am here, I am with God, and I am saved. And they were shooting through the window, what if, what if, what if? So Moses has got to shoot it through the window because he tried to deliver the children of Israel by his own hand, and he made the blunder of everything, and not only did Israel, I mean, not only did Egypt get mad at him, Israel got mad at him. So that is one of if that shooting through the window didn't work, what if I tried again and the shooting through the window has come by? Man, that, we can do that stuff all the time. But look at Moses. How can Moses think that way? Look at what's taking Look, God's got him. And then we do the same thing. All the time. So, 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 so just watch this. Instead of what is, let's start talking about what is. You know, uh, uh, excuses, think about this. Excuses are a killer. And you think excuses, Satan loves excuses because it's a dream killer. Excuses matched up with his cousin procrasti procrastination. They go hand in hand. And they bring uh, your potential to a dead stop. Pow! So you need to get excuses and procrastination out of your life and out of your vocabulary. So, so here it is. Excuse. Uh, number, one, number one, excuse number one, who am I? He said, who am I that I should go out and get these people? See, Moses struggled with a spiritual identity crisis. Have you ever had a spiritual identity crisis? You just didn't feel qualified. You thought God, pick, he thought God would pick the wrong man. We think the same thing. God will tell you, why don't you go help that person over there. Or I want you to talk to this person. Or I want you to trust me in this. I need you to do something. And you go, God, you got the wrong man. You got the wrong person. Because I'm not qualified. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the call. There's a difference. Amen? Let me say that one more time. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the call. And so whatever God looks at, puts in front of you. A lot of people are through these great old big things to have. A pool pit. Not realizing that your pool pit is your workstation. That your pool pit can be in the grocery store in that shopping park. The pool pit can be at the nursery. The pool pit can be on your lap as you hold your children on your knee. That's where the pool pits are. Don't keep looking for this kind of pool pit. Look for the pool pits God puts in your path every single day of your life. Amen? Amen. All right. So, sorry. So, God's response, it don't matter. I'm with you. I'm here. I'm with you. Remember what we tell when the what is and should have been with us? I'm here. God is with me. And look, I'm saved. I'm here. God is with me. And I'm saved. Amen? They got to live over this place. This had not happened yet. I can't change this. Right now, in front of me. So now, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. 2 Timothy 1 and 9. So the first excuse is, who am I? The second excuse is, well, who you got? We should start writing camp from here. <laughs> who you got? I know, look, look, look. He didn't know it was God well enough to even describe him to the people and, and lack convictions concerning his relationship with God. So God really gave him, the first time I heard this, I, I didn't know what to think. And I remember watching Charlton Heston at the rock, I mean, burning bush, I mean, at the burning bush. I remember seeing him, he's asking God, who is this? And when God said this, you know, my mom was sitting there beside me, my mom was spoken, you know, verbatim. And so I'm hearing, I'm hearing Charlton Heston and God's voice, and I'm hearing mom in the background. And I turned to my mom and said, what does that mean? I'm going to get ready to show you. She goes, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's also me. God's response, I am who I am. <clears throat> mm. We can't always understand this, but it is awesome, man. It's like I'm saved. Man. I'm ever present. I'm everything you need. I am here. When you got God's presence, that makes all the difference in the world. When God's presence is with you, it can ensure success. It ensures uh, victory because God is with you. 
Now therefore, Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps in covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Now we're getting to go to, to another. We can meet this normal least. We're going to keep our own going. You ready? That's excuse number two. Excuse number three. Have you ever seen any of these excuses? Who am I? Who are you? What about this? Well, why do they don't listen? I can promise you I can go to B5 and I can have 12 guys sitting in the group and I know, I know half of them aren't this I know I can, I go to, I can be in church and I can look out at the congregation I'm going Yep, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> they got this McDonald's look in their eye. <laughs> you can see the dancing sugar plums in their head. And the school with special, I'm not McDonald's, it's special, but it, uh, you deserve a break. No, no, I'm still like McDonald's for a big bite. There was seven things. Oh, oh, yeah. The all big bad special sauce, yeah. finished cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see y'all like that sometimes. Yeah. I mean, look. The all big bad special sauce, finished cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Yeah. All right. But I can't say anything because you know, you know you're a preacher when you dream you're preaching and wake up in your heart. That's right. That's a boring sermon. Yeah, I mean, there's some services so, 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 so bad that my leg went to sleep and I got jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Get, get carried away a little bit. Ready? Intimidate. Let us go to intimidate him. He was worried on that people's reaction would be to him. If you worry about people's reaction going to be to you, you will never do anything for God. There's guys, not just in the in the in the detention center. There's guys in church. There was there was a guy uh, on my first church. He wouldn't talk to me. He had like I had to play. He wouldn't have anything to do with me. And if I could walk into him, he'd hold his head down, he'd walk the other way. He only came there because of his mother. That's the only reason he came. And one day, he had a tragedy in his life. And when he had his tragedy, I went immediately to him. And I walked up to him with all these people around him. And I'm the one, I kept telling his mama, don't worry, there's going to come a time that me and him are going to lock arms. Not horns, arms. And she said, I don't think so. I said, yeah, he is. You watch. And she said, no, I'm just going to keep on being me, and I'm going to keep on loving him, and I'm going to see you watch God do the rest. And so this tragedy had happened, and I walked in the room, and all his family was around, they were comforting him, and when he saw me, he looked and he hollered, a big, a big, big old holler with tears, and he said, Brother David! And he ran to me, and I fell on my arms. I fell on him. And we sat there for 30 minutes, all we did was cry. He was going up, he just cried, cried, cried. When he finally stopped crying, he said, I can't take it anymore, I can't take it anymore, I need God's comfort, I need God's help. And I said, well, you know what you need? He says, yes, 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 I've been running the room, I guess I know what I need. And so we prayed the sinner's prayer. And from that time on, it's amazing. Not only did he get strong in church, but me and him were like that. You see, you can't be intimidated by people look like they don't want to hear what you got to say or, or you're worried about their reaction to you. It's not my reaction to me that I'm worried about, I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about your reaction to God. That's the most important. So, God's response, when I'm finished on this, when I'm through with you, they're going to listen to you. You watch. Timothy. Timothy was a very young man. Timothy was a young man but he had a call in his life, and Paul knew this. And so Paul, Paul needed Timothy as a bishop to hang on to things in Ephesus. And so Timothy said, I, I don't think I can do this. He says, you can do this. I believe in you. And so he, he made the, the bishop of this area and take care of all the churches. 
And the Bible even talked about it. It got on his nerves and it got on him so bad that he said, that's what he told him, said, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. I talked about his, his nerves were so bad. He was, he was just tore up on the inside because of the great responsibility on him. And so Paul knows about this great responsibility and how, how he's reacting. So here's what he says. He says, Timothy, for God did not give you the spirit of fear or timidity, of cowardice, of craving and craving and falling fear, but he has given us a spirit of power uh, and of love and of calm and well balanced mind, discipline and self-control. One, one, one translation of, of, of sound mind is the ability to think under pressure. The ability to think under pressure. Have you ever been under pressure? And your mind was just, just racing. I always pull this out. I pull this out and I hang on to it. God has not given me the spirit of, the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of, of, of self-control or the ability to think under pressure. So now, number four. This, this is something, I want, I, when, I, when I get through here, you're going to see, uh, this, this, is, this is very powerful. He said, but I've never been a good speaker. Okay. The Bible says in chapter 4, verse 10, Come there for one, three, four, 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 four. Here he is. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since has thou spoken unto thy servant, for I am of slow speech and of slow tongue. Hold on to that for a minute. Remember, excuses. I want you to, I want you to turn to Acts. Chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Verse 1 and 2. Let's hold it for a minute. He said, There was a good speaker. Moses spread it about his inadequacies. He said, who would listen to him? He can't even speak well. Okay? But God responds, guess who made your mouth? I did. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand, for us taking paths which he has prepared ahead of time, and that we should walk in them, Living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Now, y'all read this with me out loud. Acts chapter 7, verse 22. Ready? Remember, most of said, I can't speak. I stutter, I can't speak. Ready? And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty. In words and in deeds. Let's just stop right there for a minute. <coughs> Forty years before, you got King Moses. You got a man that had been trained in all the sciences. He was like an engineer. He had leadership ability. He was trained in all kinds of leadership. He was trained in all kinds of engineering. And 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 let me just read uh, the NLT version of this, which kind of translates these words better. Moses was talking at all wisdom of the Egyptians. He was powerful both in speech and action. He was powerful in speech and action. But that was 40 years before. Now after 40 years in the wilderness, he says, I, I don't talk good. Let me ask you a question. How many of you ever had any wilderness experiences in your life? How many of you went into the wilderness experience? You had a different opinion about yourself and your abilities than you have now since you've been through the wilderness. Okay? Let me tell you something about the wilderness. God puts us, He'd been in the desert for 40 years. He had this wilderness experience. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years. 
Why? What's the difference? Jesus, 40 days, that's the number of trial. Moses, 40 years. It's because Moses, man, he thought something of himself. And God had to get that out of him. He was a king, and he needed that. He was an engineer. He needed that. He was, he was a leader. He needed that. But he needed to have a shepherd's heart. And so until he could break that, that attitude and bring in that shepherd's heart, he was in that wilderness for 40 years. Now, what's God doing in the wilderness? The wilderness teaches us, number one, not to depend on ourselves. Number one. <laughs> Going to the wilderness, it teaches you not to depend on yourself. Number two, it teaches you not to depend on your feelings. And number three, it teaches you not to depend on your own resources. Ready? Self, feelings, and resources. I cannot depend on myself, my abilities. I cannot depend on my feelings, and I cannot depend on my resources. When I get in the desert, in the wilderness, because all that stuff I thought I was, maybe I wasn't as big a bad as I thought I was. Amen. But when you get on the other side, what you've done is you've learned not to depend on self, feelings, and resources, but you've learned to depend on God, faith, not feelings, not depend on God, not yourself, faith, not your feelings, and depend on God's resources, not your own. So maybe there was a time you were chomping at the bit and said, man, we got this! And then you've gone through this wilderness. And it drug on and on and on and on and on. And they're saying, God, at one time I thought I had it. Man, I was feeling good. And I had everything I needed. And God said, that's it. Self feelings and resources. I need you to say, God, you got everything I need. And I'm not feeling it anymore. I'm walking by faith. And I'm not trusting my resources. I'm trusting yours. That's what the wilderness is for. And I thank God for that. I don't like it. But I thank you for it. I've seen, look, I've seen young ministers, I've seen people that, that before the wilderness, and seen them after the wilderness, and man, oh man, the difference was night and day. Because before the wilderness, uh, either, uh, I'm not too sure, but after the wilderness, wow, something special happened. Before, there was pride, afterwards there's humility, and something special. Faith that has been tried and proven, faith that has not been tried, is not faith at all. So, so a scene that's on the other side, something very, very powerful. So you may be coming out of the wilderness now thinking you're a nobody, you're a nothing, that you have been drained, that you don't have the mind anymore, you don't have the feeling anymore, and I'm telling you, that's why God, that's why He puts you in the wilderness. So you won't depend on yourself, that you won't trust your feelings, that you'll trust faith, and you won't worry about your resources, you'll trust God. But I promise you, your stock is going through the roof right now. Just trust God in all of this. Amen? Trust Him. Give the Lord a hand kind of praise. Trust Him. <laughs> now, final excuse. Here we go. I know you've never said this. Never. I'm preaching wrong. I'm not preaching wrong. People are this now. <coughs> Come on, God. Can't you find somebody else? God didn't get mad with him. But the other excuses. He got upset now. Can't you find somebody else? You see, Moses feeling so inferior. Even after God talked to him, some all the things he was going to do with him, the wilderness, the wilderness had drained him of that of that pride and that ego. It had drained him of that self-dependence. And so now. Now that God's putting him back where he came from. Remember, Shulik and Wuda? What if God's putting him back in the Shulik and Wuda? But now it's in the Shulik and Wuda. Now what is beating him up too? Here's the problem I see all the time. We compare ourselves to others. You better than that. We compare ourselves to others. Even his brother. And 
I knew so was brought her air and said, you know what? I come up short. I can't do this. And God said, okay, I'll let Aaron go with you, but I'm still calling you to go. Matter of fact, he said, Aaron, give me a mouthpiece. Well, when he got there, guess who did all the talking? Moses. Once he stepped in to that freshness that came from the wilderness, wow, that's so, so powerful. Jeremiah 29, 11, the message, I love this. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you love to love. You may be in the wilderness now. There was 40 years. Moses was treated like a king. There's 40 years. Moses is in the backside of the desert as a shepherd. The next 40 years, he's a pastor, leader. If it had just been the first 40 years, he had never made it. If it had only been this one, he had never made it. But God took this and this and put it together and prepared him for the last 40 years. I showed you this last week, and I'm going to show it again. God can use you. The next time you feel like, the next time you feel like God can use you, just remember. Oops, hit the wrong button. Here it goes. Come on. Noah got drunk. Abraham was too old. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused. Moses was a murderer. Gideon was afraid. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Anybody ever seen any of this? It's my finger. Lazarus was dead. Remember I posted last week? I can't tell you how many people have been blessed by this Bethany bracelet with that either way I win or God's got this. They got it all over at the detention center and, and a lot of the deputies are wearing these. Bethany's still speaking. She's gone, but she's still speaking. And it's amazing because her faith impacted me so hard, I wanted to impact others the same way. So now, no more excuses. God can use you to your full potential. I promise you that. And remember, you aren't the message. You're just the messenger. Amen? So I'm going to tell you how to do this. Y'all ready? Yeah, well, well, you know, you said, when you tell us, get ready. You ain't going to tell us what to do. I'm telling you how to do it. Ready? Get ready. Come on. Here we go. Start out small. Start out small. God's working with you. Just start out small. Because if you get a hit of God, let's say if Satan can't stop you, this is a big one. Listen to me carefully. If Satan can't stop you, he will push you. If this don't work, if this don't work, can't trip you up. It pushes you and gives you a hit in yourself. And if you get a hit in yourself, that's dangerous too because now you're in over your head and God ain't told you to do what you're doing. And now we're in good, big trouble because you, you messed up. So start small. And then here it is. Start. Get ready. Start smart. Start simple. And start strong. I need to write it down. Start smart, start simple, and start strong. This is going to take you a lot of places. You're going to do a lot of things. If you can remember this in all that you do. Simply put, do small things. And big ways. There was a statement given to me years, years, years ago that changed my life. Man, man, did it change my life. 
And it was this. God wants you to do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Chew on it. Ordinary things in extraordinary ways. That's why God gives us power. So we can show the world what it's like when we're not operating on our own. We're operating on a higher power, a higher degree. Do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. God gets glorified when something special happens. I had a guy come, I was in Mayview, and there was, I was working at a fountain. It was amazing because any Sunday morning, every department in the fountain was represented in Mayview. And this one morning, one of the electrical guys came in, and I bet you we hadn't talked much that I know of. And he come in, and I spoke to him. We had a good time. The Lord blessed. And Monday, we went back to work, and he told me, he said, you know why I went to church? I said, I hope be blessed. And he said, I watched you. I've been watching you. And he says, you don't do things like everybody else. I said, I thought somebody said it and all. No, he said, here's what he said. Because this was doing a prayer. He said, I want you to do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. And it's one of my heart. He says, God, that's what I want to do with you. And it's amazing because years later, Years later, just a couple of weeks ago, I go to the Chinese restaurant shop and eat, and he comes up to me. And he says, How you doing, man? I'm doing good. And we're hugging. And he said, I went back to the fountain. I said, That's good. He says, You know where I'm at? I said, No, why don't you tell me? He says, I'm an engineer. And he said, I'm doing ordinary things. Extraordinary work. Wow. So, that's just, that's just power. Powerful. 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 <clears throat> Matter of fact, I got a call from the few on. I said, we hate to disturb you. We got a name here without asking. You know, and I said, you know, I told him, I said, I want you to quit. Apologize. When you tell me. They said, I know. I said, no. They said, I said, listen, you got a family that don't have a pastor, or you got a family that nobody wants, I said, call me. Just call me. I'll be there. And one of the guys told me, he said, the reason we call you, listen, because you do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Wow. It's not me. It's God. So, get ready. Start. Let's start at ASAP. Now, what's ASAP? ASAP is seeking after God's authority and His power. Don't start if you sought Him and said, God, I need your authority. I need your mind on this, and I need your power. I need your authority in your mind, and you, your authority and your power. If you don't get his mind on it, you're not going to get his authority, you're not going to get his power. So now, get ready. <coughs> Ask yourself, have I settled into making excuses versus making it happen? Has my default become search for someone to blame? Versus someone to take responsibility for me to take responsibility. It is so easy, 
so easy to blame somebody else. So easy. But it's so hard to take that responsibility. Now, you can have results, or you can have excuses. You can do it with your Indian, or you can have, or you can have excuses, but you can't help us. This week's challenge, refuse to look for excuses. Instead, look for reasons to get it done. Start ASAP. This will change your life and your effectiveness. And they said, well, how? how? Again, how am I going to get out and do this? Have you seen the people I work with? Have you seen the places that I go? Have you seen the, the guys of my crew? Have you seen the people at Walmart? Have you seen people working behind the counter at Lowe's? Again, anybody notice that the world's gone crazy? Been crazier since yesterday. Here's how you do it. You tell a word to get rid of spell. Number one, use your best. Number two, R, refuse to play the game. Anybody got any idea how to get rid of spell? A, act through faith versus emotions. Stay calm. What's that word? Right. Yes. Right. Yes. This week, whatever you do, give your best or choose to play that stupid game everybody's playing. Best it's because of money, but it's because of the other dollar, 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 dollar. I was when I was going to court to get Bethany. Matter of fact, I wasn't going to court to get her at the time. I was just going to court to be there for her. I was with her for years, going to court just to be there for her. I never get to see her. Except for some little bit of a picture. And I remember it was family court. And I hear some of the wildest excuses. Well, my mama didn't change my diaper enough when I was little. I kid you not. My mama didn't change my diaper enough when I was little. That's why I'm the way I am. Well, I didn't get fed the right formula. I'm going to kid you not. So the stuff I heard, and one day I really, 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 it blew me away. The woman stood up, the mother, and she had a 15-year-old daughter. And she said, Judge, I'm giving my daughter to you. And the judge said, excuse me, she said, I can't do anything with it. I don't want her anymore. She's yours. I'm not, if I'm lying, that's what she told the judge. And the judge says, can you come up here a little bit? So the woman come up here a little bit. She said, ma'am, you take your daughter home. And you be a mama to her. I've seen the records. You get a law on her. And it says, if she commits any more crimes, you're going to pay. Not her. Because you should have started this a long time ago, being her mother. And in fact, the gavel said, I don't want to see you in here again. <laughs> wow. No excuses. Reasons, not excuses. Everybody, everybody stay. Reasons, not going there, brother. Reasons, not excuses. <laughs> every head bowed, every eye closed. First thing I'm going to ask is for anybody here that would say, Pastor, I'm not as close to God. I know you say it all the time. Where else do you say it all the time? God, Pastor, I'm not as close to God as I would like to be. 
And I would really, really, really like to real close to him. And nobody looked around him yeah. close to him. He gets out and put the hand up and said, pray for me, Pastor. I would really want to eat close to him. God bless him, Lord. Bless him, bless him. Maybe you're here today. And you found yourself in this crazy world getting caught up in the excuse game. Everything's an excuse. You got an excuse for everything. Not a reason, but an excuse. I always thought about it this way, too, and I've read it, too. If you don't want to do it, you can come with an excuse. If you do want, if you want to do it, you can find a way. If you find yourself far enough, you can get excuse down. If you find yourself living in shoulda, coulda, woulda, and what ifs, and just keep building excuse after excuse after excuse, and you want that to stop. You want God to work through you. You want to start ASAP. And you want to do it through grace. Nobody looking around. Can we get bowed? Would you just raise that hand and say, I've got it. I've got to move forward. I've got to stop the excuses. Put those hands up. I gotta stop those excuses. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Father, you're an awesome God. You're a powerful God. And there's nothing that you cannot do. Father, I ask you to touch this congregation right now. And the minister might be told in the name of Jesus. Don't pray this with me. Father, I love you. I love you. I praise your name. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, that you didn't make a mistake when you planted me. That you got me. And I thank you, God. I know that you're awesome. That you're awesome. And I trust you. Tell me. Help me. Do not find mistakes. Oh, excuse me. Excuses. Help me not to find excuses. Help me not to find excuses. But help me find reasons. Help me find it. To move forward. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Brother Jim, would you dismiss us in prayer for us? Father, we thank you. Praise you. Thank you. Praise you. Praise you.